um, of being tech savvy, uh, we need your help because <laughs> Patrick is leaving us. Um, and so if that's your spiritual gift, then let me know because we um, have a lot of tech stuff. And I can do it. It's just I can't do it like in front and behind the camera. That's the problem. Um, so if anyone, well, you want to you sign up? <clears throat> it's actually a real job. Like we have a full-time job. Like, I mean, it's, it's being advertised. Like, you could get out of the sleep. I mean, I'm just saying, we should, we should talk. I know, but you know. Well, I know you're a big, you're big high up in the corporation, but we could talk. Um, okay, so we're going to, we have a baptism at 1030, which is very exciting. So uh, that's my son, Bradford's being baptized. So, um, yeah, by Kelly, Nick will be the preacher. Um, because Nick has been involved in one way, shape, or form with all six of my children's baptisms now. So I, um, that's why we're doing it. So there we go. Okay, um, so let's begin with our prayer. Is it up there? I believe it is. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Gracious and Holy Father, please give me intellect to understand you, reason to discern you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, a spirit to know you, a heart to meditate upon you, ears to hear you, eyes to see you, a tongue to proclaim you, a way of life pleasing to you, patience to wait for you, and perseverance to look for you. Grant me a perfect end, your holy presence, a blessed resurrection, and life everlasting. Amen. You're like, is that all? Is that all we need? We want to. I mean, that's pretty comprehensive. I love that. Okay, we have a door prize for anyone who does not have the Trinity Lenten devotional. Who does not have this? Just raise your hand. There you go. It's yours. First come, first serve. I found it. It's online also. I've been just doing it online, so I felt I would just have that sticking around. Um, also, it's an advertisement. Heinrich, can you hand me a prayer book from there? One of those red ones. I have my, Oh, actually, hold on. I don't need it. Got my own forgot. So, um, just for, because we're going to need it. Uh, also, just an advertisement for your prayer book. You should, you should um, consider getting a prayer book. We're going to talk today about morning and evening prayer, which you can do on your own through the prayer book or through an app. Uh, we'll show you about the app. But also, um, this, to be a Christian, it's online. You can get it Kindle also. But this is the Anglican Catechism, which we, we talk about, and we've referenced a number of times in the, um, the materials. And so, I would commend both of those to you. Um, in part because, you know, we talked about this, we, Kelly and I have been talking a lot about this, Liza and I have been talking a lot about it, um, about sort of the cultural moment within which we have uh, been called, and um, finding myself more or less reticent, I should say, to avail myself of the, um, of the for lack of a better word, the tools of the tradition, you know, the tools of the trade. Um, and we have forgotten many of those tools, how to use them to our own, um, it's, it's our own peril, really. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the classic ancient practice of just praying in the morning. You know, we're going to talk about this. There's a, this is just warm-up. You know, the ancient practice, well, we, we did at the 8.30, of, uh, 8 o'clock service of singing parts of the liturgy, of, of communal singing, of prayers together, you know, of listening to the Psalms. You know, for, for generations, uh, Christian people would have memorized the Psalms only because they were always being spoken. They were like always being spoken. And so when they would, um, particularly in synagogues, but then by extension when the church was founded, um, they became the, the sort of the marching battle hymns of the church, you know, these, uh, and we have forgotten those. You know, I mean, the number of churches I've been in, and, and sadly I've perpetuated this in certain ways, um, where for the sake of, you know, shaving seven minutes off of the service, you know, we, we shorten the sermon and we don't say the psalm. It's like, well, you know, we want to give you your money's worth. You know, this is an important thing we're doing here. And, um, you know, if seven minutes is a make or break situation, you should set up an appointment to talk to me. That's what I would say, because we should talk, because there's more going on there um, that we might need to unpack, as they say. So why do we say all that? Well, it's just because if I have been confessing, and this is part of the discovery class. You're discovering us, you know, discovering the rectors, the, the church. And so this is, Yanina's already heard this uh, pitch last year when she was in this class. But it's different this year because obviously we're different people. But one of the things that I have been sensitive to, and I see Nick in the back because he knows this is certainly the case, is the trajectory of my own life um, over the past 20-something years um, has taken not a, not, thankfully, not a dramatically different trajectory. I mean, 25 years ago we were... Um, I was out of college working in a Christian ministry. 
history. And I'm very grateful the Lord has persevered the perseverance of the saints. But at the same time, my current life and ministry looks quite different than I would have expected. And that's for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which the um, sort of, well, having children has really put a fine point on this. But even if I didn't, and when I didn't have children, I still was considered in a certain sense a father in God, you know, a shepherd. And so I had to consider, um, you know, at the very least other people's children, if not my own. Um, but uh, there is a, uh, outside of these walls, outside of this body of believers, um, the cultural sort of um, bulwarks or the, the, uh, the people pulling the same direction are fewer and fewer uh, to, to find. You know, it's like uh, if you stick with the rowing analogy, there's a lot of oars that are being slapped against the Christian oars pulling one direction. And that is um, concerning. It's not alarming. It's concerning. But it, is, it has uh, uh, occasioned a, uh, a rethink, uh, sort, of a, um, sort of a let's go back into the, into the cupboard or into the, into the basement of the castle and see what they used, they used to use to um, defend these walls because these walls are, are being assaulted. I mean, this is to, to use the analogy. And so, again, that's just a way, sort of an oblique way of saying that there are aspects of the tradition that, which are fairly new to me as well, but nevertheless, as I, my own life, develop and grow, you know, and I promise people every church I've ever served, I'm not going to offer anything that I wouldn't personally either need to or go to myself. So, you know, if I'm asking you to come three times a week, um, then I would come, you know. I mean, it's not like I just, um, you know, have to do this. I mean, this, is, this would be part of, the, of the, um, the cuisine. You know, like if you're a chef, you know, I also actually like eating this food. You know, like I'm not going to cook at a restaurant where I don't like the food. Um, so, you know, we're looking at uh, raising our children with a weekly routine of, of Sunday worship, Sunday education, Wednesday, or some other form throughout the week of a sort of refresh or reboot, and you utilizing that rhythm to actually um, anchor them, to hold them, to hold them fast, not just them, but me by extension. And then together we will be sort of walking in step um, as a, as a body, as a, as a church. And, you know, I've just was heartened actually as someone I was just met a visitor on, um, who had come down, as some of you have, from other denominations uh, in light of sort of some of the challenges that are being faced and the lack of courageous leadership in other churches. And of course, as former Episcopalians, we know how that works, and we have experienced that firsthand. And so it's not with joy that we welcome people necessarily, but it is with a sense of, of reverent sort of understanding, for lack of a better word. You know, I always use the analogy that I felt like when I was uh, ever a rector of a ship, and I always used the analogy, I think, last year in a sermon, because that was like the giant helm of a ship. You know, you get up, mount this pulpit, you're like, you know, out on the front, you know, like in Titanic, you know, or something. Um, there's a lot of mixed metaphors there, but anyway, um, but I, um, what's that? That's on top of the world, that's right. But there, you know, there's a reason why, uh, ch why uh, churches have, uh, one, of the, one of the ways churches have been built architecturally has been as an upside down ship, because it, it was intentionally to mirror not only the ark, but also the idea that this was a safe place, a safe vessel, you know, with no choppy wind and waters of the world. And so it's a wonderful metaphor, but I always consider us as a ship sort of like the one or two that survived the initial assault at Pearl, Pearl Harbor. You know, and so we're like, we're, we're kind of leaking oil, perhaps, and we're, you know, we're in the process of, of cleaning ourselves back up after the battle, but we're also picking people up out of the water, you know, who never would have thought they'd be floating along with us, but here we are. And so you're welcome if that's you. Uh, I represent that remark myself, you know, having been ordained. I mean, when Nick and I were in seminary, we thought we would have some heavy weather in the Episcopal Church, but we never thought we would be deposed, you know, like sort of thrown out. It's like, well, um, I mean, the possibility was always there, let's be honest. But, um, but, uh, but there we go. Okay, so let us continue. And that was my little intro. Oh, I wanted to show you this. It just, this was going to remind me of the cultural weather that we're facing. I don't know if you remember, for me, it was a seminal moment when Harambi the monkey, do you know this name? Harambi? Yeah, when was this, Nick? 2012, 2013? 2016. 2016. Well, thank you, Ben. Okay, May 28th. You know the date? Wow, that's, that's, that's remarkable. So, um, <laughs> you really, so, um, well, I hope you understand what I'm about to say then, because I, I so, but it was a marked day for me, 2006, May 8th, 2016, 28th. 
because some of you remember Harambi was a beautiful creature of God's design. You know, I think it was a bonobos ape or something like this, or, you, or, or he was a silverback gorilla maybe. Um, and, uh, and, you know, silverback gorillas can put their two thumb, f- fingers in your thumbs and rip you in half. You know, that's silverback. They're pretty amazing uh, animals. Um, and um, I only know that because when I was young, I worked out at a gym called Silverback's Gym, and I asked the owner, like, why did you name him that? And he told a little impressionable 10-year-old that story, and I've never forgotten it. But anyway, um, well, a two-year-old toddler fell into the encampment with Harambi, the silverback, and there was a hesitation on behalf of the zookeepers to shoot the, the monkey. That was a watershed event, I think, because not only did they hesitate, they thankfully, I think somebody, I think somebody eventually either who worked for the um, or zoo or somebody that was just concealed carry, like finally took care of the ape. I mean, as sad as that would be, you know, no one wants to, I mean, it, I mean well, that's a whole other issue, but the trophy hunters actually helped cull the herds to raise money for the conservation of animals and so on and so forth. But, um, but I remember watching the news reel there and saying something dramatic has changed here. Like something that cannot be articulated really because you can't teach instincts, right? You couldn't, you, the, the, the moment hesitation that that zookeeper had was not something that they woke up that morning and said, oh, let's give a hypothetical. Perhaps a two-year-old will fall into the, what are we going to do, right? There was not a sort of a preparation for that. There was just the instinct that had been uh, honed in this culture as it walked away from a belief in human dignity, which of course has ramifications, you know, all throughout our conversation about IVF and abortion and and, uh, what's called death with, dying with dignity, you know, and all of the sort of, um, the the sort of discussions around quote unquote euthanasia, you know, eothanos, I mean good death, that's where the word euthanasia comes from in Greek, you know, that's not a, um, there's, there's a, it's a euphemizing all these things. Um, so I remember where I was, and, um, and I was frightened <laughs> because I said, if my, God forbid, my two-year-old fell in, I don't have a concealed carry. I don't mind people do. I just don't because I'm, I'm, I need to train more if I did. But if, but if I'm in the event that I most likely wouldn't have one, I don't know what I would do. It wouldn't do me that good to jump in and try to fight a silverback, although I think I would, but I sure as heck hope that there would be someone on staff with a rifle that would know the distinction between an animal and a human, and as heartbreaking as it may be, nevertheless have no hesitation in protecting human life over the life of of an animal. And you would have been surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at how um, the debate raged then and continues down till today about the relative place of human beings and the hierarchy of the created order. And there are people increasingly making the argument, like this man that just died, Stephen Wise, that any and all, that there should be no meaningful distinctions in the law, in particular, between human beings and animals and particularly sort of what we say sentient animals, you know, like dolphins and elephants and monkeys. Um, uh, And so that is something that we have to observe because it is the fruit of a deeper, and this is to the class, don't worry, but there's a a fruit of a deeper sort of unmooring from, we should say, the the Christian uh, worldview, for lack of a better word. I don't love that word, but nevertheless, that helps in this case, Um, that shows and posits that human beings uniquely are created in the image of God, which means, for instance, you shouldn't eat them. You know, it's good to eat other animals. You know, they're healthy and God made. I mean, what else is a cow for other than to be used to eat, right? I mean, it's not like a sporting, um, there's no like sporting dog, you know, because there's no cow sporting cows, you know. It's like they eat. And actually, I thought it was really fascinating. Facebook, they had a picture of like all the various things that people down through the ages have gotten from cows. Like one cow can basically like outfit an entire like small battalion with everything they need from food to clothing, you know, and weapons. You know, it's like, that's amazingly, um, thank you, Lord. Lord. You know, like a rabbit. Like, what's a rabbit for? It's like a chiclet for nature. You know, that's what a rabbit, everything likes to eat it. It can't defend itself, and you can digest them very quickly. And, oh, by the way, they reproduce, like, you know, overnight. And so, thank you, Jesus. I mean, this is what we say. But humans are an altogether different, not only magnitude, but other order, a different altogether. And when we lose that, we lost, well, we, we're going to unravel. We're going to fray. And that's what we're watching happen in our, in our society. That's what we're happening in, in the Western world. And so what do we do about that? Well, we preach, first of all. We preach, um, but you preach in particular to someone that you are watching unravel before your eyes, whether that's a niece or a nephew or a child or your spouse, 
You're watching them unravel because once becoming unmoored, well then the only way a, uh, you know, the, the natural prog progression of a um, unmoored line, again, I'm not a sailor, but I just have these in my head today, is to unravel, you know, become a afraid knot, you know, pulling the, the, um, the little line from the, um, from the sweater and all of a sudden it just begins to keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And so we preach, this is what you're doing here, like you're learning to become preachers. I didn't want to, I want to shock you in the first class, but that's ultimately what you're going to be, is a preacher, not only, in, um, not only will you know where you should go to hear a sermon, so you've been putting your time and energy here, and it's very humbling for us, but we take that with great responsibility. You know, we spend a lot of time to make sure that we're actually saying what you need to hear, you know, to cooking the food that will satisfy and sustain you. But you'll also, so you'll know, one, what a good and bad preacher is, which is important. You'd be surprised at how many people don't know that, you know, and they sit for years, decades, under terrible teaching that's not biblical, that's, that ultimately leaves them in their sins, you know, either, and that can be conservative or liberal churches. You know, you can be guilted and, and um, you know, the footloose pastor is just as much a progressive as he is a, as a, as a conservative, you know. I mean, there's no, there's, there, the sin and misunderstanding of the gospel are spread wide. Um, so you know what a good preacher is, but also you know how to preach to the people in, your, in your, your, your neighbor. You know, you know how to talk to your niece or nephew who perhaps has gotten into some pretty serious um, and, in, and in some cases shocking situations that you, you find abhorrent and yet you don't know what to say. You say, well, um, you know, I know a man that forgives all who call upon his name. You know, I know a place where, where all types of people have come and been restored and healed and renewed um, because I know the gospel. I mean, that's, so this is all part of, of that. But you can't, just like the person who hesitated shooting Harambe, you can't gin up the instincts to know the gospel, to preach the gospel, to, 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 be, to have the words at your ready unless you have been saturated in them which is why we put the psalm back in, which is why we take a little bit more time with the sermon, which is why we, we stand up and get down and, and spin around, you know, because we are embedding this in your souls, through your ears, so that when you, the metaphorical two-year-old falls in the, the cage, you know what to do, and you're not, you're not hesitant. You know, when someone evinces their need for the Lord by, by confessing their despair, by articulating their guilt, by, by showing that they are on the verge of hopelessness. When they say that, you are at the ready. That's the goal. And so all of this is to that end, okay? All right, well, that was a long intro. <laughs> Nothing's changed, Nick. There we go. So I have 17 slides, and I'll get to three of them. Okay, so today we are going to Discovery Crest Lesson 4. And as you might not be surprised, I hope you're not totally surprised, this is all about trusting the Bible. This, is the entire, this entire section is about trusting that God has, in fact, spoken into the world. You remember the primal sin in Genesis 3. Did God really say? I mean, Nick, this is a sermon touched on this. We didn't coordinate, but this is a good overlay. Um, that the primal sin was not simply the rejection of God, but ultimately the obscuring of His presence in the world through willful rejection of Him, as Paul says in Romans 1. And so therefore, as the sermon, it's a good, great, perfect flow right into this, um, we are unmoored cannons. We are ships without the, the North Star. We are, um, we are floundering. This is the result east of Eden um, of sin entering into the world. As I often say, which you didn't mention, but you'll feel free to add it to the other. I have some extensive notes for you. So the, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, that's, that's like the worst thing preachers. Just so you know, a very interesting sermon, Pastor. I'm like, please don't say that. So like, at least not right after. At any rate. Um, so uh, the... Um, what was I going to say? The, uh, you remember the, the, the position of Adam and Eve after sin entered the world, right? And we talked about this two weeks ago, but it bears repeating. They were hiding, naked, ashamed, and afraid, right? This is, this is what the position of human nature is before God until they are reconciled through Christ. And so we, we instinctively know that we are not holy, just, righteous, and good. And we surround ourselves with people who say, there, there, it's going to be fine. You're not as bad as your father was. You're not as bad as Hitler. You're not as bad. Don't feel so bad. You've got to love yourself first. Her first, hardest person to forgive is yourself. You'll hear all these platitudes, and they do nothing. Um, and people sink slower and slower and slower until they are saved. And so that is the picture of sin. It's dark, but so is Good Friday. 
you know, but it's not the final word. But it is, as we heard preached today, the first word. So what is the scripture for? This is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And remember, Paul, I commend First and Second Timothy and Titus to you. If you ever wonder, um, you know, people have sort of different ideas of Paul, mostly ill-formed and, and ignorant, frankly. Um, but one of the biggest misunderstandings is they forget that he was a pastor, first of all. He happened to be a brilliant theologian, but he was fundamentally a sinner saved by grace who had a deep pastoral heart for other sinners who needed grace, right? This is what the Apostle Paul was. And if you want to see that on full display, go back and read his letters to his protege, his son in the face, Timothy, first and second Timothy, and then his, to a certain degree, lesser affection, uh, Titus, as far as we can tell from the letter. He wasn't as close. You know, it wasn't like the, his, his deepest friend, Timothy. But it's a beautiful letter, and in it, he's, Timothy has gone to uh, plant a church in Crete, right? Crete, yes. And, um, and he uh, is, is uh, wondering if he's old enough, he's fit enough, and he actually has been called. You know, and I can say, as, a, as I'm not a young man anymore, but certainly as a younger man, um, I uh, often wonder that myself, you know? It's like, well, did I really make a mistake? Should I have just gone to, um, you know, I would have been a very generous hedge fund manager, Lord, if you just put me in a different, different, uh, different industry. Um, why am I here, right? And so I would read First and Second Timothy with, with deep uh, affection because it, in a sense, was being used by God through the Spirit to speak to me, and not just as a pastor, but simply as someone that's wrestling in the world with all the various things. Part of what Timothy was worried about is, you know, is information for the journey. Like how exactly can we trust this, this, the scriptures as they would have been known then, which, as you well know, were in the process of being compiled. Like this became part of our scripture, but the scriptures about which they were speaking was almost exclusively the Old Testament, and then would have been the development of the Gospels, which ultimately came into form in their uh, sort of their more largely current form uh, in the mid to late uh, first century. But this was all in the water. Paul's letters were in the water. Uh, the Gospels were being compiled. You know, people were remembering what Jesus said because the Holy Spirit promised they would. Remember? He said, don't worry, when I leave, I'm going to send you the helper who's going to let you remember all that I told you. And that's what happened. Mary was still alive, you know, so she was like, get a pen. I'll tell you a lot what went on, you know, um, and so on and so forth. So the Bible was in the process of being compiled, and Paul pins this very encouraging and descriptive reality to our uh, understanding of the Bible to, to Timothy in chapter 3 here. He says this, You, however, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, excuse me, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings also that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Amen. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete excuse me, equipped for every good work. Okay, well, that is quite a sufficient statement or quite a comprehensive statement about the, the work and the role of the Scriptures in the life of Timothy and, by extension, believers. That all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. So you're going to learn something from this. For reproof, it's going to come against you when you, go, for instance, are in, um, coming against, at the very least, the Ten Commandments. You know, the, the moral law of God is going to reprove you. It's going to correct you then. You know, you know, you should not be committing adultery. No, you should not be coveting. No, you should not be um, uh, uh, bearing false witness, and so on and so forth. And then finally, for training in righteousness. So we're not simply going to be sort of left on our own as exposed and judged, but rather we're going to be equipped for the training in righteousness. Now, as you know, in good Reformation form, the righteousness that we have is fully and, wholly and fully imputed to us by Jesus on our behalf. We are, as it were, clothed in Christ, says Paul, which means you don't have to be afraid of being unrighteous before God, as we say in Epiphany, until we, we, when he comes again, we will rejoice at his um, we will rejoice at his uh, uh, coming, is what the prayer says, uh, because we have, been, we have been redeemed and fully made righteous by faith in Christ. That being said, 
There is still growth to be had and work to do, which is not motivated out of a servile fear, but rather a genuine and growing love for neighbor. And I mentioned this before, you know, I, I, um, I was, <laughs> I haven't mentioned this story. So when Liza and I were first married, uh, this is almost 21 years ago now, she worked for me. Like we had dated for three years and I was, she was a freshman when I was a senior, so I had to like hold on and wait and finally we made it. And she worked for me and we were in a ministry in Vero Beach, Florida. And I um, was only beginning to learn the depths of my depravity and my need for mercy. Um, and not, well, in part because it was so easy to hide because I was a relatively, quote unquote, good person. You know, I mean, I was in ministry. I was, I was a role model for high school kids. You know, I was a good, I uh, could speak well with adults. You know, I was, I was fine. You know, I was great. Well, one time I had to drive down. We were going to a youth meeting at Bethesda by the Sea, which is in Palm Beach. And I was sort of the, um, I was the mercenary youth minister. Like they didn't like the youth program that they had going on there. So I was like the, the guy that like came in. I mean, I was the, anyway, that's just what it's. They actually said ministry still exists. It's called Focus. And if you want to, I would highly recommend against it at this point. But if you wanted to subject your child to a boarding school in the Northeast, like Chode or St. Paul's or Deerfield or all the lists that I uh, worked in, well, then um, you could hire someone like me to be a mercenary and go in and at least try to spare your, your dear uh, grandchild from the ravages and the assaults of unbelief that they would face, even in an ostensibly Christian place like St. Paul's or where Liza went, um, St. Andrew's, Delaware. So there we go. So. I was one of these people going into Palm Beach, and I didn't really want to go. It was late, and I, but so and Liza was my employee, and, um, and I reminded her of that because I didn't want to go by myself, right? And so I was sitting there sort of uh, just lovingly and very lovingly uh, reminding her of her, and she said, well, I don't really feel very good. And I said, well, you know, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, you have a fever. I mean, that was very polite. It was very loving. Um, <laughs> But anyway, long story short, she was like taking a nap and she's like, okay, I'll get up and go. And she puts one foot on the floor and then gets sick all over the room. Um, and, you know, and sort of like when your child now says they feel bad and you don't believe them. And then all of a sudden you're like, I feel terrible. Like you have a deathly <laughs> ill. Well, at that moment, I was like, you are a bad man. Like, you, are, you are a bad husband. And I remember it was almost like an audible voice. And I said, well... I'm certainly not as good a husband as I thought I was before this incident. And I remember reflecting on it with Liza, because of course I, I, I started weeping and I was get back in bed and I'm so sorry and I'm sorry I missed. But I remember that was now as the first step on a journey towards self, which is say not discovery, but revelation that has um, persisted to this day. Um, and, but the, conf- but the, the, the wonderful juxtaposition of the promised mercy, secured righteousness of God in Christ for people who are also still sinners is that you can confess these things and you don't have to be afraid. And you actually can, out of growing love for neighbor, begin to fight for righteousness, which is a quorum deo before the world, knowing that ultimately it's secured. You know, so now I sit there and I say, well, I know that I'm capable of, of uh, sort of ridiculous heights of, of uh, sort of selfish um, blindness. I'm, a, I'm capable of this. There's no question. And I have this woman who has pledged her life to me, and I have these children that the Lord has given me to shepherd, and so have mercy on me, God. Like, this is not a, this is not a theoretical anymore. And that's a prayer that a Christian can make, knowing that the righteousness has already been secured And yet the Bible can continue to reveal so that you can be uh, taught, reproved, corrected, and trained. That's that's what God has given us. And I, you know, I really, um, the Bible is an amazing book, and it is not in any way like other quote-unquote religious texts, Um, not the least of which because it pulls no punches in how it describes the depth of our need. Like, go back and read Judges. Just read the book of Judges. You know, look at the, the, the people of Israel who, uh, the, even though being the covenant people of God, in every generation were prone to wander, as we're going to say. Like, in every generation went back to idols, said we were better in Egypt, thought that, like, worshiping, um, uh, you know, Aphrodite in the sort of the sex temple in Athens was a lot more uh, fun than getting circumcised, you know, or something, for instance, you know, just to name some of the options that Paul was dealing with. Imagine being a youth minister, you know, in Corinth, you know, you're like, uh, son, you need to turn away from, just, just don't even go anywhere over there, you know, it's like going up to Baton Rouge, like, there's just a giant 60-foot wall between Baton Rouge and New Orleans and Bourbon Street, as far as my mom was concerned, you know, and that was just how it was. Nevertheless, he, God has redeemed 
people out of the dire straits that they're in and is in the process of, we don't say cleaning them up, but renewing them, you know, because this isn't a moral improvement society we're in. This isn't a, this isn't a heart reven, uh, renovation church. You know, we're not in a, I mean, I, we could pay you all, and there's all sorts of things that, you know, people have lost weight, they stopped smoking, they quit drinking, they don't do drugs, you know, they've gotten on the straight and narrow, and praise God for that. But that's not Christianity, I mean, necessarily, um, because a lot of people who are Christians, um, you know, still wrestle and struggle with these things. But they begin to be renovated from the inside out into people who are, um, as we've heard on our Lenten series, um, you know, who are beginning to know what is good, true, beautiful, and perfect. So that's what Paul has given us in this. So let's keep going. Oh, that's the Apostle Paul. That was a reminder for me. Um, I'm not an art historian like Kelly, so I just, I'm sort of a Philistine. Like most of my analogies are no longer appropriate because they have to do with South Park. And so I cannot um, do them in good conscience because I'm worried my children will start watching it. So <laughs> I've got to find a whole other level of, this, of, uh, of references that don't involve South Park. Um, um, but so I'm looking, I'm looking. So what do we have? Article 6. That was kind of a joke. It's kind of a joke. Like South Park is awful, but the ideas are pretty, substan- pretty amazing. Um, so uh, the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for salvation. This is, um, and I'm, again, I, as we have been wont to do, we're assuming that you have read through some of this stuff. So I'm just giving you the, I'm giving you sort of the distilled version of it. But uh, this is for your edification, this guide. And so please take, read, mark, learn, and, and really digest because um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource, but it's, it's lengthy and, and thick. But um, one of our articles, Article 6, says this, Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament, of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. Okay, well, I, there's a lot to be said about this, and I've said a lot of it already, uh, as, you, as you may know. Um, but, but suffice it to say, this was a very freeing article for the Reformers in particular, because... Get this, people that didn't have the Bible and were in positions of authority, particularly positions of authority that had to do with guilt and remission of sin, um, could find themselves in situations where they began to, we should say, abuse that power um, by telling you that you should, one, be guilty for more things than you should be, and two, being the arbiter of how and when you had sufficiently relieved yourself of that guilt. And if you hadn't done sufficient number of penitential acts, like Hail Marys or Our Fathers or whatever, well, then you could always write a big old check to the church just to make sure that you were covered, all right? I mean, that's a pretty seductive system, right? And so into that system, the Bible was thrown, and it blew the system up because all of a sudden you begin to read things from the Apostle Paul about how no, through works, no, the works of the law, no man is justified, right? So there's no amount of penance that you're going to be able to do to pay off your sins. I'm sorry. Like you, um, you know, for some people, they think that's a good exchange because they don't think they're particularly bad people until their, their beloved wife of six months gets sick and they realize that they're, um, they, um, had a real sort of self-interest problem, right? Um, but there are people who think that's a good, good deal, and then there are people who know the depths of their sin, and they are terrified. And so the only way to deal with an actual realization of your sinfulness is either to have it forgiven, which is another way of saying becoming a Christian, or running from God. That's what you do. And so all the people that are so angry and so like, you know, dismissive of church and things, at the heart, according to the Bible, they are in fact running from the righteous judgment of God on them. And that's because the law is written in the heart, and until that is silenced by the gospel, it will just eat you alive. And the way to deal with being eaten alive is to turn the music up louder around you. That's what happens, metaphorically or, or practically. You know, immerse yourself in something else that will keep your mind off of the, the great beyond, the possibility, uh, the, what, the what dreams may come, says Hamlet, right? Macbeth? I forget. At any rate, um, it's there. Um, so this is what the reformers knew. This is what Archbishop Cranmer knew. He was like, this is incredibly freeing. Like, you can come to me and say, look, you're telling me I should feel bad about X, Y, Z. Like, show me. Show me where this means. Now, I can tell you, as we've talked before, there are sort of wise principles about how to live, you know. I mean, but, but those that cannot be elevated to the level of, and if you don't stop, you are putting your soul in mortal peril unless they are clearly articulated in the Bible. I mean, we can have all sorts of disagreements about all sorts of things that do not rise to the level of, 
of sort of salvation issues, and that's very freeing, because that means you can lead your family differently than I lead mine. You know, you can choose to watch South Park, um, for instance, um, and I can say, why, well, you know, uh, I think this is funnier than you all do, obviously, but, I, but, um, but I, you know, we can disagree about that in a Christian way, and we can say, well, you know, uh, we, but we will not elevate that to a fellowship breaking or a salvation level issue, which is an incredible um, sort of unifying f- function there, right? Okay, so we're, we're still in the, um, uh, the catechism here, which is this book. Um, and so, I, again, I'm not going to go through all of these, these verses um, exactly because we don't have time, but that we are aware of the primacy, the place, and the, the foundation of Scripture in the life of our church. And to the extent that we, we moved that foundation, uh, we got off track, um, you know, for at the very least two generations, if not really practically speaking, you could look back at the last 150, 200 years and see that when confidence in the Word of God was lost, then it is only within a generation or two where the faith no longer exists. That's what happens. Um, and that doesn't mean that we, as we say before, believe sort of blindly. You know, I mean, I went to, a, there's a lot of money invested in my education so that I could stand up and talk to you um, f- about the authority of Scripture. And it doesn't mean you had to do that, but somebody needed to do it. And so we did it for you. Um, but doesn't mean we can't offer it to you. You know, we're going to actually stay tuned, but we're going to offer some um, sort of next level adult education um, sort of diplomas and certificates in the coming years. Um, so you may feel uh, called to further theological study. But, um, but, but suffice it to say, we are very aware of the challenges to making the assertion about the authority of Scripture, very aware of the various linguistic you know, um, realities of Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Coptic and all the various things, we're very aware of the, of the history of transmission, of the way that things are um, sort of ordered and passed down. All of these are incredibly interesting things, which I have a library literally uh, full of books that I'm happy to share with you. But at the end of the day, the fundamental question, which is before everyone in all of these issues, is simply whether God exists. Because if God exists, well, then God will make himself known how he would like, and he has said that he will make himself known through his word, through the work and ministry of his incarnate word by the power of his spirit, but he will communicate through inspired authors what he wants us to know, sufficient unto salvation. And so if we deny the possibility of God, well, then, of course, the Bible becomes much more indecipherable and challenging and confusing because it's 66 books and different authors and over to various um, uh, cultures, and, um, and you know, there's, there's, there's challenges to it. But there are also answers to all of these challenges, which, are pre, uh, which presuppose or at least are, are situated upon the fundamental confession that God exists, that he has made himself known, and this is the way that he has done it. And so, again, there are, um, there, there, there's a, there are wonderful discussions that you can have as Christian people about disagreements, about dating of the various books of the New Testament, about, um, about uh, well, that's, that's a big one. I'm just in the middle of a book about arguing for earlier dates than we have otherwise known, and I'm interested in that, but it doesn't change my, my faith one way or the other, just, you know, what specific date do they think Mark coalesced, for instance. Um, but, you know, the fundamental argument of the Bible is that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the grave, having atoned for the sins of the world. <laughs> so, if we begin with that, well, then some of the other challenges seem a little less, well, challenging. You know, and this is what, so if that's our fundamental understanding of God, well, then we will, hey, guys, the godparents in the, in the house, the Gregories, hey, guys. Um, uh, we, uh, so that's, that's sort of the fundamental uh, sort of uh, con- conviction. And that conviction, as Nick will preach about, comes by faith through grace on account of the Spirit. Like that faith comes through hearing. That cannot be, you can't read yourself into this. I had an experience, direct experience. I mean, as you know, I did a, a, a doctorate in, in, um, in uh, Berlin, and, um, and I was in a theological um, Wissenschaft, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the school, where it was by no means a uh, requisite for a theological study that you were a believer. Like, absolutely no. In fact, as far as, I don't want to 
disparage anyone, but as far as I got to know some of the people in our cohort, um, I might have been amongst a very small group of people who not only were studying theology, but actually believed it and was an active preacher the same way. And one of the reasons actually I went to Europe was because they don't really care. Like they said, you know, there were some schools here that if I wanted to make some arguments about, um, well, for instance, current cultural issues with respect to the, what the Bible had to say with them, they would, um, well, throw me out. But over there, they were like, listen, as long as you can do the work and show, make your argument well and, you know, dot all the I's and put the umlauts where you should, then um, we'll give you your degree. You know, it's not easy, but you can do it. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds good. Um, I never forget, I was at a Society for the Study of Theology, which is a conference in the UK at York, which is a very cool place um, to go, and, and not the school, the city, because that's York Minster, but the school is like one of these mid-century 70s, mid -century 70s monstrosities, you know, that looks like, a, looks like our, our um, post office over here that they designed to suck the souls out of us through our eyes. Have you been to our, our the most beautiful island in the world and they have this, this monstrosity of a post office? Anyway, um, they did that on purpose so that you would lose hope when you walk in. Um, uh, so it's true. I mean, if you went in that, it's like you're outside in the, and then you walk in and it's like, I have been transported to one of the levels of hell, like one of them. And there's one of them. And I felt bad for the people working there because they know it, you know, and I'm always trying to be nice and like smile at them. And they're not having it. I mean, you know, God bless them. So anyway, so I mean, we could have, anyway, I mean, where's the ARB? You know, we can't even put a sign up without 75 people like signing off when it's, you know, it's a historical and architectural warrant for the island. And yet we can have that. So why did I say all that? Well, I talked to a guy that won the BART award and I was like, we were having, you know, like afterwards there was a reception and I walked up to him and I was like, and Carl Bart's a famous, infamous um, uh, uh, Swiss theologian. And he won this award, and I was like, hey, congratulations, you know, I was like, I'm J.D., I'm saying blah, 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 and so he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I'm glad I wrote the paper, I just wish I believed half of it, you know, and I was like, say more, you know, and he didn't really say more, except that his father had been a bishop, and he grew up in the church, and all the stuff, and yet he was sort of outside of the, of the faith, and I was just struck by that, because it was such a foreign concept to me, that you would do any of this without a one fundamental abiding and persistent belief that God actually exists, that the Spirit was alive, that the, the, His worship, He's listening to us sing, you know, I mean, He's hearing our prayers. Um, and so that's the fundamental conviction. When you have that, by the power of the Spirit, enriched through worship, uh, deepened through your study, well then, like we'll hear in the sermon today, the words of God, not just the commandments, but simply His voice starts to echo and come this isn't a Bible, through his word, um, for your comfort, for your edification, for your training, what do we say? For your correction, reproof, uh, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And that's um, something that has deepened in my life over time. You know, I mean, and I always say there's some very challenging things in the Bible, particularly in our cultural moment, about men and women, about husbands and wives, about children and parents. Very challenging, right? And so I always preface some of these that when you'll come to the rector's forum in here by saying, listen, our fundamental conviction here, at least from the front, um, is that God is for us. These are, these are good things, and they will challenge us. We will be reproved. Paul says we will be reproved, but it will be correction in light of God's word for our training in righteousness. And that's why we don't do it alone. I mean, don't take it, I, I, far be it for me, and, and I'm, I'm grateful I can stand by this. You know, we have our sort of, our flavor here. You know, I have a particular sort of theological, I mean, I'm a person, I have a personality, for lack of a better word, a theological personality, but I am endeavoring to say nothing um, outside of the broad stream of understood Christian thought um, because the Lord helped me, you know, mega noito, says Paul, God forbid, because what we want to do is preach afresh the gospel in every generation, not anew, but afresh, and that's what we're doing. So we have, we have different challenges, you know, the Apostle Paul didn't have cell phones, but he had a giant um, sex temple to Artemis he had to deal with, so, you know, there's some similarities there, <laughs> actually, and um, so, you know, we got to kind of wrestle with that, but, um, but we do it in service of of perpetuating, as Jude says, the faith once for all delivered to the saints, right? Okay, I'm going I'm to keep going. We're almost done. So um, these are articles, ministries of the Holy Spirit. These are the principles, how to understand God's Word, just briefly. These are helpful if you consider these. Illumination, so this is why we preach. It's just another way of saying 
um, getting saved, right? Faith comes through hearing. You have to have a preacher. You cannot just wake up and preach to yourself. We're about to preach to Bradford, my son, the indelible sermon of baptism, and that will be a constant refrain the rest of his life. You have been given to God. God exists. You're going to be afraid. Don't be. He is forgiving you. How do you know all that, Dad? Well, I know it because he's revealed it through his word in his son, but he also gave us this sign and seal to give to you, which we did lovingly and joyfully well before you could even, well, you can make a lot of noise, but well before you could speak so that this sermon would persist because you have to hear it, right? So the illumination, then reason. So we do think about these things. You know, this is just something I've said since I was in college when I was speaking to my, uh, I mean, they give college volunteer ministers way too much authority, my ex- personal experience, because a senior in college, I should not have been leading a group of freshmen, at least from a theological standpoint. Nevertheless, one of the things that I do think persisted was this statement that there has never been a question that you have uh, concerning the efficacy, veracity, and truthfulness of the faith that has not been already addressed. Never been one. And people have been um, at the height of every conceivable sort of academic endeavor you can imagine, and also believers. So when you have the doubt, perhaps yourself, or you are assaulted with someone who says Christianity is for the ignorant, the unsophisticated, or the, um, the otherwise dense, that's just simply not true. Like, it's something that atheists and sort of um, rebellious teenagers like to tell themselves in the midst of their rebellion uh, because it seems like it will ultimately paper over the sins that they're committing, right? Like, well, we know there's no, you know, past the joint, we know there's no God, right? You know, past the, you know, whatever, we know that there's nothing really wrong with any of this, right? Right? And then the one person who says, well, maybe there is something wrong, they get kicked off, you know, but they're immediate. there's a lot of people lined up to sit around to try to tell you that there's nothing wrong with anything you're doing, right? Because they don't want it to be wrong with themselves, which is in part why when we have an entire sort of um, uh, uh, crisis of pornography, um, you know, quote-unquote f- uh, free sex, and, um, and then on top of that abortion, there is an unbelievable amount of unforgiven sin in the world right now, like in the West. And you want to know why people are looking for death with dignity? Because at some point, the wages of sin really is death. And you realize that, you know, there might be some final release from this persistent sense of guilt and shame that um, would come on the other side of a quote-unquote death with dignity. I mean, this is what, this is, again, and I, Freud's not a Christian. I mean, he saw this in the culture of death. I mean, this is nothing new to me, um, but it's true. And, you know, we have an enormous amount of unforgiven people running around telling us that nothing they're doing is really wrong, um, all the while the heights of depression, despair, and ultimately suicide are, are spiking all around us. So we've got our work, out, work cut out for us. You know, that's why we sing. That's why we, we, we pray. That's why we, we, we take a little bit more time on a Sunday morning than we used to, uh, because we need to be geared and steeled for this battle as much as anyone. Right? I mean, I'm speaking to myself as much as y'all. So um, we're almost done. Principle of tradition, simplicity, history, harmony. Okay, uh, read through those. But I want to leave you with this final thing here. Uh, did not write it down. Um, this, uh, the importance of scriptures and public worship. Two models of how to have a personal, private time and daily worship. I just want to leave you with this. I will send the, the link to the app is in your book, but it's a lot of little letters. So y'all all have, I will get Jessica to send you the app store link because I have to admit, and Kelly's not here, so he won't um, shame me, but um, I don't actually use my prayer book or morning and evening prayer very often anymore because the app that they have put together is unbelievable. And it already puts the readings in and it'll do morning, midday, Compline, it'll do a family prayer or it'll put the feasts in. Like it is it is as maybe, you know, there's a flip side to every technological advance. This is a good one. And so I will send you the link because it is a worthy, and it's free. It's free. And it's ACNA, Book of Common Prayer, ESV translation, all the things. So um, that's what I use. I'm not a, uh, I don't like electronic books, but this one was so easy to use that it's like, it's, it's made me rethink. Um, but because it's all in here too. It's just a little bit more cumbersome. And then to conclude, I don't know if you have a personal journal, a prayer journal, but a tried and true method, which I was glad to see they have put in here, is ACTS, the ACTS acronym. And you take one piece of paper and you begin with adoration to the Lord, then confession, and then you do thanksgivings, and then supplication. So you one page, this is what you're not going to start off if you say, like, I'm going to fill up an entire binder today with my new Lenten devotion to write 45 pages a day. You're not going to do it. 
But if you take one page, and maybe like a small one, and you break it up into four little sections, and you just start there, it has been a tried and true, it's not magic, you don't have to do this, but if you're looking for a tool, that's a wonderful tool to, uh, and if you're looking for a season, like Lent, um, where you might have a little bit motivation, well then all those might come together for you to use that in your per personal journaling. Okay, um, I'm going to leave us now because we have got to get to this baptism, but um, any questions you all have throughout this class, email us, call, like anything that has, it can be as far afield as you want. We may not address it explicitly from the front, but you know, I've referenced a lot of books and a lot of questions and a lot of resources, and I have all of them, and I'm happy to well, I'm not happy to, but I will reluctantly lend them to you um, with, with a lot of, I'm sort of joking, but I do put, I don't like to lose them, but I'm, but I'm happy to, to lend them to you. Um, and if you have questions about the Bible, about the authorship, the dating, about the miracles, about anything, then we're here for you. This is what we're here for. So we want to, if your life is a garden, we want to remove the impediments for growth. And some people have, you know, just a little, need a little bit of fertilizing, and some people have got like a turned over oil drum, you know, and so like, so that one's easy. Like, we're just gonna move that. Oh yeah, look, now you have grass. So um, that's what we're here for. So Kelly will be with you next week, um, and we look forward to having you back. Let's pray, and then, you know, y'all are here, so we're, we're getting out of the way. Um, Lord, thank you for um, your word. Thank you that you have inspired your um, your apostles, uh, your people, to uh, lovingly transmit the faith once for all delivered to the saints through um, your word by your spirit. We pray that it would deepen in our heart and we would be those who are, who are um, trained, corrected, reproved, and ultimately strengthened for the life that you have put before us outside these walls. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, make sure you grab a week five. And if, who has the sign-up sheet? I'll go ahead and take that from someone. Get it. Well, we're going to get it to you. Very important. Yeah.